Good day. My name's uh, Graham Hammer. I'm a professor in crop science at the University of Queensland. And um, it's a pleasure to present this uh, seminar on the APSIM Initiative online series. Um, I've been involved with the APSIM Initiative since the onset of the development of APSIM in the 1990s. Um, and I'd, I'd like to share with you some thoughts about the nature of crop models and modelers that we need to advance crop adaptation and improvement. It's, so it's not, there's, there's not such a technical presentation about how to use AppSim is a little bit more about um, why we need it and, and what, what is sensible to do with it and what characteristics, what uh, attributes one needs to do that sensibly. So it's a little bit more of a discussion about crop modeling and its relevance and um, how to do it. So there are five sections to the presentation. The first one is about serious play with crop growth and development models that I just call CGMs for sure. So, so the, the point there is about extrapolating beyond experimental possibility so that one can use simulation as a means to innovate. And I'll expand on that a bit. And this introduces the question of credibility, which is an area I want to focus on throughout the talk. The second section is about CGMs and in silico exploration. And I'll give two examples of what I mean by that. One in relation to application to crop design, genotype by management by environment interaction for a sorghum case study. And another one on simulating emergent phenotypes for application to breeding. So the first one is more agronomic and the second one is more in relation to breeding the genetics. And, and then the third part is, is really about if we need credible models to do the in silico exploration, how do we assess CGM credibility? And I'll give some indication of what I think is, re is relevant for that in terms of quantitative and qualitative tests. Fourth point is then how do we assess model credibility? So it's not only about having a model that works, it's people who use them have to be, have to understand them and um, have both technical and interpretive capabilities to use them with credibility. And I think that's a critical point. And I'll come back to some broader implications about serious play with models and how connectivity across disciplines is needed to really make it work. <clears throat> so the, the first part of this is, is about um, serious play with CGMs. And what I mean in this is, is really about um, using crop models as a technology to look at an issue, but to generate results or simulations that support discussions about specific problems. So they're not really about um, finding solutions, they're about finding pathways to solutions. And, and to do that, you really need to undertake um, analysis of scenarios. And so you need, you need credible scenario analysis, and I'll come back to this point about credibility, to be able to use simulation to innovate. And the book, it's an old book now, um, on serious play um, about simulation to innovate that a lot of companies have used, not just in, you know, very few of them in this book in agriculture, um, but using models as a method to bring your thinking together to help you solve problems around discussion of what the models can do. And beyond that capturing the understanding to ex to allow extrapolation beyond experimentation and I like the picture of Charlie Messina's on the right here um, where if I just get this uh, pointer working there we go where you can see um, a connection between the real world and the mathematical world and the looping between those systems in, in that context in plant breeding. So using experimentation and data to generate uh, simulations and modeling and inform what happens in the field and what happens in the field to inform what happens in the model. And I think that's a um, ongoing interaction. So if we think about crop growth models, the second part here and in silico exploration, um, we, I think all know what crop growth models are and um, 
I like the picture of Corinne Chanuz, which sets up the notion of the um, dynamic interactions and feedbacks that happen inside crop growth and development. And really all a model does is putting those into algorithms to give you a predictive schema. With some mix of theory and empiricism, we have theory that covers many of these things, but not all of them. And so some of them are purely data driven. And we've got to have some data driving in here to, to be able to come to reasonable predictions. And the, the main thing is that these, these algorithms capture the non-linearities and context dependencies for predicting G by M by E, by e outcomes. And they're, they're fairly unique um, form for doing that. And you, know, you can use simpler statistical procedures, but they don't really capture those non-linearities and context dependencies in the way that models do because of the interactions inside the dynamics and the algorithms that, and equations that capture that. <clears throat> now in APSIM, I think you're probably all a bit aware of the APSIM platform. Um, we know we've got a really uh, comprehensive uh, modular structure, well engineered and good software engineering team that have put this together in a way that it's object oriented. We've got classes that operate at organ or cohort of organs level. You can parameterize specific crops. You've got parameters and processes that deal with morphogenesis, source sink interactions, uh, allocation, partitioning decisions, and, and stress responses. And so, and there's a very good quality assurance and version control system. So we've got a capacity to build a knowledge bank that grows and develops as the science improves. I want to give you a couple of examples that some of them go back quite a few years, but um, there's, I think they're still relevant in terms of this notion of in silico exploration and application to crop design. And this is the, a case study for genotype by management by environment interactions in dryland sorghum in Northeast Australia where the effective use of water is a critical factor. Highly variable rainfall, you can see down the bottom here, it's the annual uh, rainfall in this part of the world. So it's in sort of Northeast Australia, the sorghum belt here. And just want to think about the notion of managing uh, management factors like row configuration and density and the genetic factor maturity early or late maturing type. And here's a skip row system uh, where one can plant two rows, skip two rows or skip one row. Um, and it's a water saving sort of system that just gives you a reduced canopy development, obviously a reduced potential yield. But to be able to model these systems, you really need to be able to understand and quantify the dynamics of water extraction across these gaps. And so there are specific experiments undertaken to do that where we measured water extraction under rain out shelters with sorghums spread at, at quite a distance between these rows. And this graphic here, you could then determine each of these lines is a, is a measure of water uh, content of the soil and by depth, so this is depth. And then you can see the gradual spreading out of the capture of water by the root system from the two rows. And so we can put algorithms together that capture the dynamic of how a skip row crop um, accesses water in the soil. And similarly with density and tillering, we can change the canopy development, which changes the water demand, increase the density, you increase the leaf area, increase the tillering, you do the same. And so you get this dynamic effect on demand for water. <clears throat> and if you put those two into a simulation system, we can look at um, a simple trade-off between a standard strategy where we might have a medium maturing cultivar, five plants per meter squared, and every row is planted. So this is a fairly conventional agronomy for sorghum. And so that's the standard yield for a hundred year simulation. And if we contrast that, we plot against that the yield of a high input or a low input strategy. So if we intensify, go for a later maturity, 
higher density, then you get these blue points. And if you go for a low input strategy, same maturity, but a lower density and a skip row system, then you get these red points. And you can see that you get this trade-off with this higher intensity system paying off in the high yielding seasons, but causing grief in the poor yielding seasons, whereas the low intensity system is much more stable, but overall on average, a bit lower yielding. So you've got this trade-off between um, productivity and, and risk, and, and really it's the decision maker's attitude to risk that um, determines which way to go there. So the, this provides basis for the discussion, um, <coughs> excuse me, not for, um, doesn't make this, the, the, doesn't give you the answer, it just gives you a basis to discuss what an individual might want to do depending on their attitude to risk. In, in breeding, similarly, we can think about um, simulating uh, complex phenotypes via their component traits. And we can, if we think of the model in the middle here, then we can use that to detect what aspects of genetics are connecting to various coefficients in the model. If we have a, a, a phenotype, biomass, yield, leaf area, whatever it might be, then we can dissect out the components of that and how they are parameterized in the model. And we can use that to predict the phenotype. So those parameters connect back to the, to the genotype, which can connect us through to the phenotype. So we can, with, with that understanding of how these uh, traits relate to the genetics and to the phenotype through the dynamics of the model, we can simulate some of these trait dynamics. And I want to give you a, a particular example for stay green in sorghum, which is a trait where there's a tendency for leaves to stay green under terminal, terminal drought as distinct from senescing. And this enhances yield under terminal stress and reduces lodging. And if we look at how to, how to, um, how to model that, then there are a couple of mechanisms that um, we can, we can look at, and in two in particular, I want to consider uh, tillering and limited maximum transpiration. So if you think about tillering and sorghum, this is a picture here, which shows tillers. And then the more tillers you get, obviously, the more leaf area you produce per plant, and so the, the greater the water use. And tillering is controlled really by a couple of things, um, internal plant competition for assimilate. So if the main culm is uh, growing actively, it tends to suppress tillers. So if you've got early vigor, high leaf appearance rate, large leaves, then that tends to reduce the number of tillers. But there's also hormonal regulation that will change the tillering propensity of a particular genotype. Each of these factors can be connected back to genomic regions that control the leaf appearance rates or the, or the hormones and the combination of those things gives you the number of tillers that you ultimately um, achieve. Similarly, limited maximum transpiration rate relates to sort of plant hydraulics. And if you look over here, you've got transpiration rate against vapor pressure deficit. So as you get to higher VPD, you've got higher transpiration demand. Some genotypes are able to meet that higher demand because they have a higher internal hydraulic capacity, whereas some don't, and they stop, stop increasing their rate of transpiration at high demand. And we can simulate the consequences of those things under terminal drought. And that's what we've done here. And if we look at reduced tillering, for example, this is plant available water content on the left axis, leaf area index here, and the orangey uh, simulation is the high tillering type, the green one is the low tillering type, and this is the water use associated with each. There's not a lot of difference, but the low tillering one, which is the red one, uses slightly less water, which enables and it produces less leaf area. So 
its senescence doesn't start until a bit later. And so you're actually simulating stay green. You're not telling the model that this genotype is stay green. All you're telling it is about tillering and it's generating stay green as an emergent phenotype. And that gives you slightly increased yield under these terminal stress conditions. Although when you then uh, apply that across a hundred years of seasons, you'll see it's advantageous in these seasons where uh, there's terminal drought or some water limitation and yields below about four and a half tonnes. But it's disadvantageous when you get into good seasons because you haven't got the leaf area to take advantage of the water that you've got. Similarly, with limited maximum transpiration, what happens here is the plant uses um, reduces its conductance during the middle of the day when vapour pressure deficit is highest. So it actually has a slightly increased transpiration efficiency. And so the similar leaf area, but the one with the limited transpiration uses water uh, less. And so the red line, which enables it to maintain its green leaf area longer. And in this instance, again, generates increased yield under terminal drought. Um, and is not so disadvantageous at, under very high conditions, but still has a bit of a trade-off because you're shutting stomata in the middle of the day when they could otherwise be uh, capturing CO2. So again, you can simulate the emergent complex phenotype from an understanding and quantification of the traits that underpin it. So <laughs> what, do we, what do we have to do to have um, crop growth models that are credible and sufficiently credible to do that sort of thing. Um, I, I think there are a couple of points that, you know, that a CGM must reliably generate the emergent phenotypes relevant to the question at hand. So whether that be a yield prediction for an agronomic management or a trait variation, um, it, it's like hypothesis testing. You've got to have something that gives you a credible prediction of that emergent phenotype. And so you've got to be able to extrapolate predictions to a diverse set of situations in what I call the adaptation landscape. So that's the broad G by M by E set of circumstances that goes well beyond where the testing where a model is built. It, you, it's got to be able to extrapolate in a credible way. So how do you assess that? And I think there are three ways you can do that. Firstly, you can look at the ability of the model to predict phenotypic outcomes for diverse experiments with high quality data. And I can't emphasize enough the need for high quality data. You want to have a situation where it's not the data that's questionable. If the model can't predict the data, it's the model that's questionable. And you secondly want to have an ability to generate known responses to key factors. So if you know there are agronomic or genetic responses, then the model should be able to predict them. And similarly with emergent phenotypes with key traits. So there are sort of three things that you can use to assess model, model credibility. All of those require close attention to the realism of the functions in the CGM and their grounding in experimental and in, in ex experimental evidence and theory. And so it's, it's important that um, in parameterizing models for these sort of tests, it's clear the parameterization is transparent. And so you, you, you're learning when or why does the model fail. I want to give you one example from some work we did on, on maize, um, testing a, a maize model when we added a nitrogen component to it. But, but really, um, this is just to sort of demonstrate where you've got a high quality data set from a PhD study where both the soils and the crops were measured in detail and you've got a no stress situation, a mild end stress and a severe end stress. This row of graphics is biomass components. This is nitrogen content of those components and this is the leaf area index and specific leaf nitrogen. And you can see that in, in general, um, this sort of, you know, it's a good test of the model to show that it 
the dots of the data from the very from the weekly harvests and the simulations of the of the lines. And so in general, some exception down here for leaf area under severe end stress, you know, the model is able to predict the dynamics and the effects of these sequences of these treatments on this very detailed data set quite well. You, you can then go beyond that and say, well, if we're not, not high quality data where we've measured things every week, but we've got lots of experiments where we've, we know we've got high quality data with good soil, weather and crop information, then you can do these predicted observed plots across a wide range of experiments. And you're looking to get something um, close to a one-to-one -one relationship across those ranges of data. And where you get a couple of outliers like this, you can go back and, and look at what's going on. And I think I remember in those couple of occasions, there was some, um, you know, a, a very small change in the soil made a huge difference, the stress occurring at a critical time. And so you, know, you, you can look at this and say, this is about the level of predictability you can get out of a reasonably credible crop growth model. Beyond that, we can look at um, soil data and I like this uh, video. And so um, if, if you've, what we've got here is measurement of soil water over time, where the red line is the upper limit, the blue line is the lower limit, and we're going with depth. The green are the measured data points and the green line is the simulation. You can see the root depth increasing and the simulation tracking the data. This is from a neutron probe data under a rain out shelter experiment. And so it's a very good test of the model to say it can, it can predict the change in soil water content over time with fairly, um, fairly good precision. <clears throat> and this, the second point about assessing credibility was to generate known responses to factors. And so here we've got a nitrogen by plant population experiment in maize. And if we look at the second panel, it's yield, there's, um, you know, un under high nitrogen, and this is irrigated under high nitrogen, you've got increased response and yield to population, whereas under low nitrogen, you tend to crash out. And this is what you would expect. So the, um, the filled symbols are the observed values, the open symbols are the simulations. And similarly for biomass and yield, you, you get the expected result of that response from the model, which gives you some confidence into, in its credibility. <clears throat> you can do something similar for emergent responses from genetics, from traits. Uh, it's a fairly complicated example, but if you want to chase it up and say, go and look at Charlie Messina's paper in Insulaco Plants. What we did here was we, in, we in enhanced the maize, <coughs> maize model, <coughs> excuse me, in APSIM by adding a grain abortion routine that looked at cohorts of grains along the ear. And this, these experiments uh, were experiments where there was a series of different water stresses that were relieved at different times. And this is flowering. And you can see this has had, this is the kernel number or the silk number with a severe flowering stress with the flowering stress ended after seven days after flowering, 14 days after flowering or well watered. And you can see this one actually has some, some abortion. And with this cohort model, um, we're able to simulate that sort of response reasonably well. So here's the, the data for yield for two years against those different stress treatments where um, the first one is the well watered and then the different levels of stress. And you can see the simulated yield response. The, the, the dots in here are different maize hybrids and it picks up the pattern reasonably well perhaps not so well in the, in the S2 treatment. Um, but you, could, you can simulate a, um, an, a sort of phenotypic outcome like that by changing some of the details in a uh, cohort grain model. And it would then generate the yield versus anthesis silking interval. So that is 
commonly used or observed in maize, but in this instance, it's generated by the model. If you change the silk extension rate from low to high, um, you still get the same um, yield versus um, anthesis silk interval, which is a well-known response in May. So the model could generate that. So I say it's a, it's a little bit more complicated, but and it and it required a more detailed component model being added into AppSim to be able to do that. So um, the third the third part of this then is is about assessing uh, the credibility of um, crop growth models and a little bit about the nature of the, C, the, the of, of the CGM. So it really must allow for, for useful advances in the functions incorporated. It's a bit like the example I just gave, where we're able to introduce a detailed model of the maize ear using cohorts of grains to replace the whole plant grain number model. But at the same time, and I, and I do like to go back to some of John Monteith's old papers, that there's really a need for balance between simplicity or comprehensibility and complexity um, and comprehensive scope. And, 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 I, and I think, you know, as simple as possible, but not simpler is not a bad way to deal with this. And the notion that biological reality and parsimony don't need to be independent and perhaps shouldn't be was something that I discussed in a recent review in, in Slico Plants. So things just don't have to get more complex to, to get more biologically real. But you've you've got to you you have to think about um, the nature of the uh, of the realism that you want and what level of complexity you need to go to to get it. So I I, I think ultimately um, my view on this is 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 this models structured to readily allow variation in the biological level of process algorithms while using coding and computational advances to facilitate high speed simulation could well provide the structure needed for the next generation of crop models needed to support and enhance advances in crop improvement technologies. And in fact, I think within the APSIM initiative, we're probably doing that. And so you, you have a system that enables you to bring in additional complexity into some of the algorithms when it's required. What about credibility of modelers? And this is always a tricky one. Um, and again, it's, it's very nice to go back to John Monteith, who made the comment in his nice paper in 1996 that crop models are potentially powerful tools, but they should be used in a more disciplined way. Um, I'm not sure much has changed in 25 years, um, but I think it's very important that we, we really understand the, the discipline of using a crop model effectively. And that model testing is, is about, is a scientific process, not a marketing process. I, I'm still shocked by people um, just trying to tweak parameters to get their predictions to look better and get another couple of points on an R squared. It's really not what it's about. Um, and so if you know if if you need to do that, it's probably not going to help you with um, with wanting to extrapolate to conditions that have that are a long way beyond your test set. So it's really about understanding how the model works, learning rather than than parameter adjusting. So it's important to understand the biophysical underpinning and the functional dynamics of the CGM so that one can interpret the simulation results and be, and be very clear on what the model can and can't sensibly do. Models are really good at some things and not good at some other things and, and you've got to know their strengths and weaknesses. And that depends on how they're structured and you need to understand that. Beyond that, the, the models don't give the answer. They, they give you scenarios, analysis of scenarios. So it's, it's important to engage transparently with ultimate decision makers about what simulations are telling you. And that provides 
um, very good fodder for discussion. And so I, just to finish the point, um, you know, models are powerful tools, they can do wonderful things, but we can really jeopardize that if we use them naively. So what are the implications of all this? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a great believer in serious play with crop models and, and its capacity to assist innovation. I suppose I've kept doing it for long enough. I'm either a, a believer or, or stupid, but I, I'm, I think I'm a believer in, in, in that statement in, and, and I think there's good evidence now to support it. But we do need to have interaction across disciplines and good connectivity and co-learning to make that happen. And I think, again, there's some good evidence of, of, of that being effective. And so that needs teams to integrate biophysical insight from research with analytical and predictive capabilities within the context of practice. So this notion of practice, research, modeling, and their interaction is really how things can be effective. I really like the picture that came out of the um, US Department of Energy when they were looking at investing in, in improved uh, plant breeding in, in that they had all these experimental genetics, computing, um, you know, phenomics pointing into the breeder in the middle here doing his uh, field assessments. And I thought, oh, that's all pretty good. They've got all these disciplines together. But what they really missed, I think, was the fact that, you know, it's a two-way street. These things need to be equally informed by what the practitioner is doing. It's not just the theoreticians informing the practitioner. So just a final quote on co-learning, which I, I think is really critical in this. In, is, is that if you, if you don't understand it, you can't model it. And a lot of um, theoreticians or uh, basic scientists might argue that to you. But the, the retort is if you don't model it, you can't understand it because often you don't really get a good understanding of the dynamics and the interactions that are critical. So with that, um, I thank you for listening and um, I hope you're enjoying the seminar series.